Ladies and gentlemen, please stand by. Your webinar is about to begin. Please use the volume control on your computer or tablet to adjust the sound for this presentation. <coughs> Good day and welcome everybody to the Canadian Obesity Network webinar series. Today's presentation is Rethinking Success in Obesity Management. What are we aiming for? My name is Don Hatanaka, Education Director for the Canadian Obesity Network, and I'll be hosting today's webinar. This public webinar series is an exciting opportunity for the Canadian Obesity Network to interact with Canadians to disseminate credible and evidence-based information about obesity. Through this platform, experts will weigh in on issues in obesity bias and discrimination, prevention, treatment, policy, and more. If you'd like to be part of our public community, please become a member at obesitynetwork.ca backslash public and opt in for our newsletter. An archive of this webinar will be posted and available for viewing on obesitynetwork.ca webinars page. Um, due to extremely high volume of requests to join this presentation, we have disabled microphone and question and answer features. However, we do want to answer any questions you might have. So if you have a question you'd like to ask the speakers, you may do so via social media or in the evaluation survey at the end of this presentation. Now I'd like to introduce Drs. Mary Forehan, Dr. Sean Wharton, and Dr. Michael Vallis. Dr. Mary Forehan is an assistant professor in the Department of Occupational Therapy at the University of Alberta. Dr. Sean Wharton is a diplomat for the American Board of Obesity Medicine. He's an adjunct professor at McMaster and York University and is also at Michael Guerin Hospital for Internal Medicine. And finally, we have Dr. Michael Vallis, who is the psychologist and lead at the Behavior Change Institute. He's also an associate professor at Dalhousie University in Halifax. And with that, we'll start our webinar. Okay, I'm uh, Dr. Mary Forehan, and I'm going to be talking uh, in depth to take a look at how health professionals and people with obesity are rethinking accommodation. So satisfaction with participation and performance of everyday activities is an important outcome for individuals living with obesity. Creating a space and opportunities are needed to achieve such outcomes. This requires that healthcare professionals talk about the facilitators and barriers to participation in everyday life with their patients. It also requires that accommodations be made. Accommodations are adjustments or modifications of actions in response to the needs and wants of individuals living with obesity. On the second slide, we will be defining participation. So participation, according to the definition used by the World Health Organization in the International Classification of Functioning and Disability, states that participation is the involvement in a life situation or the lived experience. In this case, we're talking about involvement with life situations that include mobility, self-care, domestic life, interpersonal interactions or relationships, work, community, social, and civic life. And we know from research that participation in daily life contributes to health and wellness through the acquisition of skills and competencies and also the development of social networks of support. It's often referred to as a determinant of health, particularly within the occupational therapy frameworks. On the third slide, we're illustrating the framework of the ICF or the International Classification of Function. This includes listing the health condition in the top box. The ICF includes five domains included in the framework, which include body functions and structures, activity limitations, environmental factors, personal factors, and participation. Restricted participation results when there are impairments to body functions or structures, physical factors including gender, age, economic status, and or environmental factors, which are factors in the built and social environment. 
On the next slide, we're specifically looking at obesity and some of the participation restrictions associated with the health condition of obesity. In this figure, I've inserted key threats to participation associated with obesity. Pain, fatigue, decreased range of motion, decreased mu muscle strength are all factors that can be related to body functions and structures associated with having the health condition obesity. Activities such as mobility, sleep quality, are also impaired or limited. Factors in the built environment include restricted access to places and spaces with living, where living actually really takes place for individuals. Factors in the social environment include weight bias and low expectations regarding persons with obesity. Personal factors that have been known to impact participation include age, gender, education, economic status, social network, and the client or patient's beliefs about obesity. These are all factors that through research we know to be associated with some individuals living with obesity that actually have a, a negative or some type of impact on their ability to participate in their daily life experiences. All five domains influence each other and have an impact on that lived experience or participation for persons living with obesity. Key areas often affected include work, self-care, leisure, and rest. There are opportunities to address all of these threats to participation within each of the five domains. And this is where the uh, talk and, and application of accommodations to the way in which people perform activities of daily living, the use of assistive devices and interventions to reduce activity limitations, structural changes to the environment, advocacy to address social attitudes and interventions that can address modifiable personal factors such as education about obesity as a chronic health condition. On the next slide, number five, um, I'm going to be talking about uh, working with clients that I've, I've done throughout the last 20 years or so uh, in the context of my role as an occupational therapist and most recently as a researcher. So I've had the privilege over the years to be hearing stories of patients living uh, with obesity who are in treatment programs for obesity and telling detailed stories about the way in which they experience their day-to-day -day activities. This slide shows the results of a study in which patients in treatment for obesity were asked to describe uh, how they went about their typical day. Three key themes emerged, which were tensions related to participation in the occupations of everyday living, in which participants described a desire to engage and participate in roles such as parenting. In this particular example, a parent described wanting to do more with their children, but finding that the mental and physical effort to do things with them was at odds with her interest. There was a gap identified between interest, ability, and opportunity. This particular participant identified fatigue, pain, and stigma from other parents as factors that created the mental and physical effort. The second theme discovered in this study was that barriers to participation. In this theme, specific structural and systemic barriers were identified. In this example, the size of seats on public transit and motor vehicles was identified as a primary barrier to engaging in participation. The third theme that was discovered in this study were strategies to participation in everyday living. Participants described a resilience and persistence to participate in things that they needed to do and or wanted to do. They described different ways of approaching tasks, such as taking longer to do tasks associated with life roles, but feeling satisfied that they were able to get things done. On the next slide, is a summary of research findings from various projects from several studies over the last few years that really focused on having a better understanding of what is it like to live day to day with severe obesity. Participants described a disconnect between what they wanted to do and what they were able to do. Participants also reported participation patterns similar to adults with other chronic health conditions in the areas of daily activity and recreation. Disability status was the most significant factor in the prediction of satisfaction with participation. 
It was concluded that obesity does limit the diversity and quality of participation in daily living, particularly among participants living with obesity who are actively involved in treatment for obesity. And the last major key finding was that participation limitations were enhanced by barriers in the built and social environment. On the next slide, we'll talk about what constitutes um, a meaningful day. And that really varies from person to person. Meaningful activity is based on personal values, beliefs, and experiences. The types of activities that I've heard patients with obesity identify as important and that are restricted as a result of living with obesity include being independent in self-care activities such as bathing, getting dressed, preparing meals, participating in health services and programs, being able to do physical exercise to the degree that they want, feeling safe moving about their home and community, being competitively employed in positions that match their interests and abilities, socializing in public places with friends and family, and access to good quality health care that is delivered respectfully. These are examples of some basic life events and also some more complex participation. Specific activities that can be identified as outcomes of success in obesity management are as follows. So rather than looking at a weight-specific goal, patients were asked to identify outcomes related to performance of activities of daily living. And some examples that have been reported by patients include being able to tie my shoelaces, walk my dog around the block, reduce my fear of falling in my home, my workplace, or in my community, to be able to sit comfortably and safely in the driver's seat of my vehicle, feeling more rested when I wake up in the morning, being able to pick up an object from the floor when I drop something, feeling less out of breath walking around the store, my place of work, school, etc. Being able to get up and down from the floor to play with my children or my grandchildren. Feeling safe getting in and out of the shower. And another example is reducing pain in hips and knees. If you move to the next slide. It's really important to find out what is meaningful participation for patients in treatment for obesity. It can be really as simple as asking the following questions. Tell me about a typical day in your life, starting from the time you wake up until the time you go to bed. Are there activities that you need or want to do in your typical day that you find challenging? Are there strategies that you have found help, that help you get the activities you want and or need to get done? Another way is to really formally assess. There's several interest inventories that can be easily done in a clinical setting uh, with very little training to go through them. Uh, there are some more formal or customized assessments often used by occupational therapists. One that's quite well known nationally and internationally is the Canadian Occupational Performance Measure. And you can find more out about that one at the copm.ca. This particular tool helps to identify and prioritize everyday issues that restrict or impact a patient's performance in activities of daily living. There is a myth that accommodating people living with obesity will make life easy and that there will be no incentive to engage in health-promoting behaviors. Quite frankly, the truth is actually quite the opposite. By creating opportunities for individuals living with obesity to participate in meaningful activities and life events, the health outcomes are quite evident in the research. We know that there's increased confidence, decreased poverty, increased energy to engage in a variety of activities, and less demand on the healthcare system. Accommodations isn't about making things fit for persons living with obesity. It's, it's about not making people fit into things. Examples of accommodation strategies um, to engage individuals living with obesity in healthcare services is outlined here. We want to help engage patients with obesity in healthcare services, work, physical activity, self-care, leisure, and recreation. Energy conservation is one strategy that is often recommended to individuals living with chronic health conditions for the purposes of having enough energy available throughout the day to accomplish their daily goals 
energy conservation strategies are not energy restricting. Rather, they provide opportunities to reduce the effort or risk in performing some movements or activities, and it frees up energy for priority activities that are really important and meaningful for the individual patient. Using assistive devices, such as long-handled reachers, to pick things up off the floor or things that are out of reach, using a stocking aid to help pull on socks and stockings, using a dressing stick to help don pants, shirts, and even to hook up the hooks on the back of a bra. Pacing activities by reducing the number of steps or stages required to complete a task is really important. An example of pacing would be to organize a kitchen so that the fridge is close to the counter or table where a person can sit to complete food preparation rather than walking back and forth several times or standing at the counter. Mobility devices such as walkers uh, with wheels and a seat or a power scooter provide opportunities for reducing the risk of falls, having a place to rest as needed, and open up opportunities to move about in the community. Mobility devices are also highly recommended in workplaces where there is a great deal of walking long distances that may burn unnecessary energy and uh, enable a person to be able to engage more fully in the work environment. Energy conservation strategies and mobility devices also help reduce pain and fatigue. Support garments are something that is newer and coming up on the market more readily, uh, and they are designed to help support excess skin and tissue resulting from significant weight loss. Supporting this mobile tissue is known to create a sense of stability, balance, and confidence in patients with obesity that results in greater satisfaction with participation in life events. This includes physical activity and socialization. There are um, compression garments available that do help with circulation and reduce the risk of developing blood clots. Those are usually require a prescription and people are encouraged to explore whether this is a need for their patient. Examples of universal design are grab bars placed near a toilet or a seating area, seating that is flexible to support various sizes and shapes, sliding doors that maximize doorway widths to accommodate wheelchairs or scooters, wider and deeper steps on staircases to increase visual field and stability, and they create a much safer stair use opportunity. Universal design is a concept that aims to create spaces that are accessible for everyone, and more recently includes patients with obesity. It's really important to anticipate rather than react. It's important to know what the needs of patients with obesity are to create welcoming and safe spaces in the care environment. Some examples of accommodations that can be standard for all healthcare service delivery settings include providing seating that will support and provide rest for patients with obesity, having assessment equipment that will accommodate patients with obesity. This includes things like tape measures, blood pressure cuffs, and the scale. Provide assistive devices in change rooms and bathrooms used by patients. This could include long-handled reachers to help with uh, picking things up from the floor, uh, a long-handled shoehorn to help patients get their shoes on and off, and grab bars to help with raising and lowering from seating positions. Knowing the dimensions of doorways, weight capacity of the equipment in your office and site, and furniture, Location of the elevator and be aware of other potential barriers, including the location of parking and bus stops. All of these uh, elements can create uh, an atmosphere of welcome and also accessibility and is known to increase the adherence to follow-up visits and carry on with services. It's also really important to consider eliminating all reading material that may promote fad diets or portray negative images of persons living with obesity. This does usually include most entertainment, fashion, and fitness magazines. You want your clients, while they're waiting for you, to feel welcome and safe and know that you show a great deal of respect. I've included a link to a documentary that was made in Ontario uh, in 2013. Uh, this documentary uh, follows the lived experience of uh, three individuals living with obesity and really focuses in on identifying specific needs and benefits of accommodation. 
And on the following slide, there's a list of references that I have referred to some of these uh, study results throughout the presentation and encourage everyone to consider rethinking looking at accommodation as an avenue to health and well-being and uh, an opportunity to engage participation and promote uh, the health of your patients living with obesity. Thank you. Hello everybody, this is Dr. Sean Wharton here and I want to thank you for joining the webinar. Our topic today is Rethinking Success in Obesity Management, What Are We Aiming For? To me, this is a very interesting topic. Now, here are my conflicts of interest. And the objectives is to look at weight loss that defines success. So, and what should we have an expectation of? and what are some of the new therapies that are resulting in a greater effect in regards to weight loss. Now, we know that many people will eat or can easily lose weight, but then regaining weight is a, the big challenge, and that is a very disappointing time for people. Therefore, we know that there's a lot of biology that dictates the fact that weight is regained very easily. And the reason for this is that obesity is a chronic, progressive, relapsing medical condition. Once you have obesity, it never goes away. You'll always be struggling against it. And the question is, is how big is that struggle? How hard is that struggle? And are you able to keep some weight off for a sustained period of, of time? And so, and the reason for this is that Weight gain is natural. We know that people gaining weight is a very natural process, but losing weight is a very unnatural process. Therefore, as a result, we've got to put a lot of things in place to be able to keep the weight off over the longer term. Now, when we've been looking at weight loss, the 2006 Canadian guidelines dictated that a weight loss goal would be 5 to 10% of body weight. Now, we know that many times we talk about the fact that weight should not be our primary goal and we should be looking at health or other type, of, other type of behaviors. But we are all aware that our patients frequently want weight loss specifically and they're asking for it. And until we come up with some degree of a solution for our patients, this question of can I lose weight will continue to come up and can I keep it off? And we've always um, frequently, or over the past number of years, we've defined a reasonable weight loss goal as five to 10% body weight loss. And why did we come up with five to 10, 10%? Um, uh, and we'll go over that in a second, but the question is, is, is this five to 10% enough weight loss for a number of people? And should they, should we be expecting more? And that's the big question, right? Because we know that if we, we tell somebody that you're going to you can lose 5% of your weight through this method that I'm going to work with you on, they may not be all that happy. So what are people actually looking for? And so a study by Gary Foster showed that um, uh, if someone's initial weight is 218 pounds, their dream weight would be a 38% reduction happy 31 percent reduction acceptable 25 percent and they'll be disappointed at 17 percent weight loss now we know that that even in a very good program it's very challenging to get to the disappointed weight loss and so um 47 percent of patients in uh active weight management program did not even reach, reach their disappointed weight. So we can see that people want more. And if we look at what doctors want, this study looking at 101 internal medicine residents, a questionnaire on weight, they looked at successful weight loss as, um, as a 21% weight loss. Although 18% felt that 5 to 10% was a, a success, that means that a good um, 80 Two percent of patients, uh, of, of phys, uh, physicians, residents, did not feel that five to ten percent was a successful amount of weight loss. So, we can see here that most people, patients and doctors, are looking for more. Is that possible? Should they expect more? What is the actual possibility? So, we do know that you can get more through things like bariatric surgery. 
So if somebody wants intense enough weight loss, they're 400 pounds, they're 350 pounds, they're getting problems with their knees, can they get significant weight loss? Yes, through, through, through bariatric surgery, they certainly can, and that is an option, but it, it is invasive and it can be a challenge. So um, if we look at lifestyle modification, what we see is that the ability to keep weight off, and this is a um, meta-analysis looking at 13 studies, and over six months they were able to keep 14% of their weight off, but over the four to five year time frame, 3% weight loss on average. So if we look at where we're getting this 5 to 10%, it's because it's very challenging for us to achieve greater than 10% in the current environment if we're looking at just lifestyle. Now, um, and this is because, as we, I said previously, the human biology is, is to defend your highest weight. So your brain and your body always acts against the lifestyle modification, it acts against the pharmacotherapy, it acts against the bariatric surgery. But we get greater and greater amounts of weight loss as we move from lifestyle into pharmacotherapy into bariatric surgery. So 5 to 10% weight loss does give us benefit. And we see that blood sugars is the first thing that ends up getting better. Um, and as we move to higher amounts of weight loss, we get a reduction in cardiovascular risk factors, lipid profiles, in blood pressure, um, in obstructive sleep apnea, and quality of life. But we can see that we need more and more weight loss to get greater amounts of effect from these other metabolic, metabolic conditions. So now in our study, we looked at people who lost 5% of, of weight in, in our program. And you can see here that their blood pressure came down if they lost 5%. But those who didn't lose 5% still had benefit. Their blood pressure did come down. So just exercising and eating better, you, you do get some benefit. So again, health is with 5 to 10%, but the expectations are greater than that for other reasons that the patients want greater amounts of weight loss. And again, we did a large study here looking at um, 7,000 of our patients. And you can see here that the majority of our patients stayed in the weight stable range or the minimal amounts of, of weight loss range. But a small percent of patients achieving 21% weight loss. But we know that the majority of our patients would prefer to be in that red line where they're getting 21% weight loss. So how can we get there? So um, we know that um, med med medications, and this is a study looking at looking at liraglutide 3.0 milligrams, and we can see here that over a one-year time frame, um, uh, patients were able to get approximately a 8% weight loss. That's an average weight loss of of 8%. Again, that's in the 5 to 10% range. Patients are expecting more. Can they get more? Well. What this study also showed was that categorical weight, weight, um, weight loss, there were some people who lost more than that 5, five to 10%. Here we see that 92% of people lost, lost some weight, and here we go, 63% lost 5%. But here, here we have 33% of people losing more than 10% of their, uh, uh, um, of their weight, and 15% weight loss, 14% of people lost that much. So from a categorical standpoint with this medication, there's certain percent of people that are going to be bigger winners. And those are the people who tend to stay on the medication for a longer period of time. So this expectation of greater weight loss can happen even with the current medications that we have on the market. So it's not for everybody who tries the medication, but a certain percentage will end up getting there. And when we looked at our data of our patients who are on liraglutide, 3.0 milligrams, we can see that the patients on the right-hand side of the graph lost a greater amount of weight, and the people on the left-hand side lost less weight. So the majority of people on that left-hand side tend to discontinue the medication because of a, a lack of efficacy. So we see that the people who stay on the medication are losing greater amounts of weight. So, so this this greater expectation of weight loss is possible even with the current medications we currently have. But the exciting day is coming along now where there's a much brighter um, path. As we can see here, that a new study is showing that semaglutide, 
um, uh, has weight loss that uh, has been revealed in a new study and it's showing dramatic amounts of weight loss. The expectation is that researchers are working on agents that can bring about a greater amount of sustained weight loss. And that's what we're actually seeing. And so we see here that these new once weekly GLP-1 analogs results show that in um, uh, that type, this type 2 diabetes drug was able to decrease weight of 13.8 percent in one year in people with um, overweight or or struggling with obesity. So these are in patients who do not have type 2 diabetes. That's a significant amount of weight loss, 13.8 percent on average. What this meant is that there was a categorical weight loss of people losing um, greater than 15 percent, greater than 20 percent, and greater than 25 percent weight loss. So what we're seeing is that there are more and more new medications that are coming on the market that target the, the agents that help to uh, push the weight back up. So um, we can look at different markers such as ghrelin blockers. We can look at adding amylin um, PYY, greater efficacy, GLP-1, CCK, leptin. So all of these markers are now being put in place because that expectation of greater weight loss is there. And I don't, I, and I personally do not feel that this is unreasonable. So again, in conclusion, 5 to 10% weight loss will give us good health. And that's important. The majority of people can achieve this with the current pharmacotherapy that is on the market and also with aggressive lifestyle modification. If we're looking for greater amounts of weight loss that is coming, it is expected, it is on the her, her, her horizon, and it's very positive. So I think that that expectation of more is there, and I don't feel that it's unreasonable for patients and for physicians to have a greater expectation. So thank you very much for your time and if there are any questions I'm certainly glad to answer them over um, the appropriate forum. Thank you again. Bye now. So my name is Michael Vallis and I am a psychologist who is focused on obesity management in Canada and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to present this brief presentation uh, under the title, Rethinking Success in Obesity Management. And the real question I think we all have to ask ourselves is, is what is success? Now, I don't have a long time to present, so I can actually present this entire section in less than one minute. Um, so just I'd like you to reflect on the following. Um, you actually cannot control the stock market. You might try to manipulate it, but you're at the end of the day going to have to admit that it's not under your control. You actually can't control the weather, despite your plans for a vacation down south that get waylaid by a storm. Um, you actually can't control other people, something that we learn um, quite quickly in our lives. Um, there's a theme going on here that I think is really important for us to pick up on, uh, because you actually also cannot control your biology. Um, and that's where your weight really fits. Um, weight fits under biological functions. The only thing that we can control is what we do, our behavior. And that's why I'm grateful as a psychologist to be able to contribute to this um, major revision to our goals in obesity management. I'd like to suggest to you that at the end of the day, individuals can only impact what they do. And so we really have to shift our focus from outcome to effort and reconsider the kinds of outcomes that we consider to be important. So just consider the following as an example of this quite important point. And I would like to make um, a very strong parallel around homeostasis between temperature and weight. That is the body's ability to control your temperature and the body's ability to control your weight. So what happens if the room temperature rises right now to 38 degrees Celsius? You will begin to sweat. What happens if the room temperature drops to minus 10 degrees Celsius? you will shiver. And if I was to ask you, can you stop your body's reactions? You would say, absolutely not. You're, you're shivering to warm up. You're sweating to cool down. This is how you survive. And so we know that weight is exactly the same. This slide is a demonstration from, um, it's actually quite a useful slide, I, I think, this study, because it's a very publicly um, understandable um, 
population, which is people who contribute to the Biggest Loser television show. And this is the uh, 2009 season followed over six years. And um, the two things that are important to understand here is that there was a tremendous amount of weight loss from the beginning to the end of the show. Oh, that's great. People actually went down over 50 kilograms on average. Now, the bad news is six years later, they've regained 85% of their weight. So that outcome of weight sounded so good temporarily, but over time, it doesn't really maintain that kind of enthusiasm. But the really scary part about these data is that the, the, the metabolic regulation or counter-regulation that occurred. So at the beginning of the season, there was around 2,600 calories per day as sort of their resting metabolic rate, which dropped about 700 calories by the end of the season. Six years later, it's dropped even further. And so what you have here is rate, weight regain and yet metabolic counter-regulation persisting over that regain period. In other words, for these individuals, their job of achieving healthy weights just becomes harder and harder and harder. So if the focus is on weight, which is beyond bi biological control, behavioral control rather, and is influenced by so many other non-behavioral factors, then we need an alternative. Um, here's the world we live in, the kinds of promises that are made to people. These are uh, legitimate, available treatments. By the way, most people who would pursue cool sculpting would not actually look like that picture, a very provocative picture, by the way, one might comment on why those kinds of ads are being used to advertise weight-related outcomes. And there is also this new, um, uh, really, uh, what sounds kind of like medicalized bulimia, which is the ability to empty a third of your stomach at the end of every meal by going into the bathroom and flushing out your stomach contents into the toilet. Um, just have one drink from Starbucks. It's no big deal. It's just one drink. How bad can that be? Well, depending on what this, the, uh, the, the choice is, you can see it can be actually pretty challenging. Um, and then, of course, depending on the size. And in the United States, in their cold drinks, they have four sizes. The largest size you can see here, Trenta, is actually larger in capacity than the human stomach. So the environment in which we live really challenges behavior. And so the focus on weight becomes very, very uh, um, difficult when you think about biology on the one hand and the environment on the other. And when we look at behavior, we need to really filter behavior through that environment. And so this is a slide I'd like to present because it really shows that we actually have two behavioral control systems, two operating systems of the brain. And you can see them illustrated here. In the figure on the left, in lower quadrant, you see the limbic system, the original operating system, the iOS-1. This is a primitive brain system, and it's on, and it guides our behavior, and it sends emotional, impulsive, immediate type of messages. Then the frontal lobes on the top right, which is the last part of the brain to develop, not developed in girls until the ages of 23 to 25, not developed in boys till the ages of 27 and 29. And this is the logical brain, the iOS-11. And so we have this struggle constantly. The human condition is this pull between what you want to do and what you should do. And so we really have to, to harness the um, t tension between those two systems and really support, and this is where I believe the power of the professional comes in, that we can really support individuals in being guided more by their frontal lobes, but is the healthy choices that I should devote myself to rather than the limbic system types of activities, which is what do I want to do? So in essence, we know the following <clears throat> when you look at this slide. Your frontal lobes are telling you that apples are always better than apple pies, and your limbic system is telling you that apple pies are always better than apples. And so good luck with that. And so the real issue is what's important in enough in your life to choose apples over apple pies for. And that requires communication skills from healthcare providers to help people figure out not just what to do, but the drivers of their behavior. And so when we look at obesity management, what are the outcomes that we should replace with um, from weight? So if we're not gonna focus on weight, what do we focus on? And I would say any method to achieve a healthier weight involves some doing on the individual's part. So they have to do something, be it activity, be it uh, eating, be it medication, be it surgery.
they're always engaged in some behavior. So we should be measuring those behaviors and understanding how we can actually support those behaviors. We have to look at what I consider to be the bias issues or the psychological aspect. Why are you wanting to lose weight? If I had a nickel as a psychologist in my clinical work for every time a patient said to me, if only I lost all this weight, everything in my life would be so much better. We know that's not true. Weight changes do not change other aspects of your life. So this is an issue that needs to be addressed that I label the bias issue. And if we get changes in that, we'll have positive outcomes. Expectations. Many people start a journey trying to lose weight, trying to control their weight, in which they're asking for outcomes that are beyond any um, interventions uh, capabilities, um, they're, including surgery. That They're looking for the amount of weight loss, and they're looking for a particular shape. So the expectations are key. And then the wanting component, the craving issue, food is is part of every society. Food is a, an amazingly powerful substance that bonds people together. And so we need to, to harness that and not and respect that. Uh, and then finally, the thinking component. So, so these, I think, are alternatives. So rather than just count the numbers on the scale, we could count the behaviors and we could count self-esteem changes. We could look at how people are, are being, becoming satisfied with the results of their efforts rather than becoming disappointed because they don't look like they had wanted to look. Um, so I'll finish off this presentation by just sort of touching base on each of these issues. Um, and so really the, the main point I'm trying to say is that we should be measuring behaviors and in particular the behaviors that line up with the drivers of why people do what they do. And so as a psychologist in obesity, I'd like to say that I am not invested in any specific behavioral pathway. I actually think that um, research trying to say this diet is better than that diet or this method is better than this method is actually misguided research because there are so many pathways. Obesity is such a complex phenomenon that there's no way that we're ever going to determine a, a single pathway to success. What really matters is a pathway that is sustained and fulfilling for the individual. So if the individual is able to endorse and accept and adopt the pathway such that it enhances their sense of self, it's consistent with their values and what they're prepared to work hard to protect, just like your career, just like your life partner, just like your children. Then if it's a lifestyle like that, it will be sustained. And so you can see here there are very many pathways. The bias issue is important, and I, I personally like the following two questions, and I ask them pretty routinely. When you look in the mirror, do you like what you see? Because we know that weight changes that are associated with clinical interventions don't miraculously change what a person sees in the mirror. So the issue of self-image needs to be identified and seen as an outcome. If you can come to accept yourself, I mean, just reflect on your own, your own personal self. And the question I would ask you, which may sound silly, is do you realize that that body you have is yours? It's always going to be there. And so you're going to have to figure out how to get along with it, because if you don't accept it, then fundamentally you're creating this tension that is really going to become very problematic. Second question, when you walk down the street, can you hold your head up? The bias issues, how do we empower people? How do we help people protect themselves from insensitive treatment that they continue to get in the world they live? So if you can make successful outcomes associated with either of these two issues, I would say that is a very value add. Um, Self-esteem, by the way, cannot be given, cannot be borrowed, cannot be won, cannot be earned, cannot be downloaded. It can only ever be claimed. It's the relationship that a person has with themselves, and they always have the power to shift how they view themselves. And so I think we in the health system can be extremely helpful to people in supporting them in that. Expectations are clearly problematic, primarily because they're unrealistic, and they set up something called learned helplessness. And we've all heard this, I try and I fail, 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 and eventually what do I do? Well, guess what? I give up. And this is called learned helplessness. And it is a very powerful paradigm, and the challenge is, once a person develops this, they're not likely to start again. So we have to be really careful about success being sustainable. This leads to the doing component, and what we've learned about the doing component is that it's really important for us to start to incorporate the concept of readiness. 
that are how ready is a person to change because if we can support the person in addressing that readiness component as we support them to examine the barriers and that readiness assessment is a really useful way of kind of doing this we like to use the traffic light assessment we do uh, we interview patients we ask about their readiness if if the patient and the clinician believe that that, that their their patient is ready well we just go right into the behavior modification piece if you're kind of one foot in and one foot out, we work on behavior, but we also try to draw out the values, the personal, meaningful reasons that a person will tolerate the distress associated with choosing apples over apple pies. And if the person is not ready, we don't send them away. We actually acknowledge that. We get permission to keep the conversation going, to understand what's really going on under the surface. And this is often quite um, uh, sort of overwhelming for clinicians, often tends to be really valuable for um, patients in terms of exploring why you're not ready and then the pathway towards either ambivalence or readiness. The hedonic drive issue is really important for us to become aware of that, that food is a passion, eating is a passion, it's social, it's, uh, it's calming, we all have comfort foods, we would all prepare foods as part of our, our bonding with other people. And so we really have to know, know how to, to, to harness that, how to really to get pleasure, perhaps out of smaller amounts, uh, out of different choices, and, and really, you know, in some ways I, I sometimes think that, that most of us in North America have an attitude towards food that's characterized by more of a gluttonous approach, whereas if we had more of a connoisseur approach, um, then that could be really very, very helpful. And so we know willpower is limited, and that's why we have to kind of control the environment in order to, to uh, limit access to food. We know that urges pass, um, that if you just sit with an urge for a period of time, that it will uh, fade, and that values can override. Um, it's really, you know, the expression we sometimes use is that it hurts so good. Choosing apples over apple pies can hurt so good if you connect it to your values. My final uh, comment is really on the cognition component. A lot of negative, a lot of unhelpful thoughts that come in. Most common are permission thoughts. Um, you know, well, I've worked so hard today, I deserve a treat. Or I had a good day yesterday, so I can relax today. I went for it to the gym last night, so I got some calories that I can spare. And again, these are important things that we can focus on. And there's a number of strategies. We have many, many uh, evidence-based strategies from cognitive behavioral therapies, acceptance and commitment therapies that really encourage us. Um, so um, within the time that I have, that is my presentation. Um, I hope that I've convinced you that um, maintaining a selective focus on the numbers on the scale is um, uh, really not a, a, a recommended pathway. The evidence would say that we're actually creating a, a more of a problem than a solution in doing so. And I think if we look at behaviors, and in particular the doing, the uh, bias, self-esteem, the expectations, wanting, thinking, then there are many, many outcomes in these domains that will actually have a direct impact on health, function, and quality of life. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our webinar for today. Thank you to Dr. Forehan, Wharton, and Vallis for sharing this information, and thank you to all of you for taking the time to join today. For those of you that use social media, you can tweet us using hashtag obesity talk or send us a message on Facebook. The link is right there on the screen. Or click on the survey box in the window, the one that says Survey Monkey. And it, the survey will open up on your screen and you can complete the survey right away. You may now disconnect and close your browser window. We hope you have a great day.